of, of 9-11. Because what they have is any time there's an airplane difficulty, they have a, a certain code words that they use to, to place in the indestructible term black box, and not one of them did it. And some of these hijackings went on for quite a while, you know, over, over 40, 50 minutes in, in some cases. So there was a ton of room that these uh, pilots were able to squawk a hijack code into it if that was what was taking place. So uh, the conclusion is, is that the cabins being taken over by hijackers is false. The, the important phone call to a, a lady, Mrs. Uh, Dana Burnett, which registered her caller ID as calls from her husband, Tom Burnett's cell phone, because he was a passenger on board Flight 93, could not have been completed because cell phone technology in 2001 was not capable of completing calls from airliners at high elevation. Griffin concludes that the calls had to have been faked and suggests they were faked by morph, uh, voice morphing, already a well-established technical capability at the time. After examining the claims made for many other calls, including those for Barbara Olson, wife of the then uh, Solicitor General Ted Olson, which were the basis of the claim that Flight 77 was in the air and subsequently uh, crashed into the Pentagon, Griffin concludes that the evidence that calls from the planes were faked is strong, far stronger than the evidence for the view that the calls were made by passengers and flight attendants describing the activities of, of Middle Eastern, by that you can read Arab, hijackers. So continuing on, Chapter 6 discusses uh, Vice President Dick Cheney's changing account of his whereabouts and activities at the key times during the morning of 9-11. After admitting on national TV five days later that he had been present and in charge of the president, uh, presidential emergency operations center in the basement of the White House before the Pentagon was attacked, he changed his story in November and claimed he did not reach the, uh, the uh, PIOC, as, as the acronym is, for, for the Pentagon attack. Griffin shows that the 9-11 Commission report upheld Cheney's otherwise unsupported second account, which absolved him of all responsibility during the key incidents. Pentagon attacked and the destruction of Flight 93 in Pennsylvania. So he shows that such evidence ignored by the Commission, contradicted by Cheney's second story, including Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta's testimony before the commission, counterterrorism czar Richard Clark's published account of the morning, and reports from ABC News on the first anniversary, all of which the commission buried without mention. So when you have a commission trying to get to the bottom of what happened, they're not doing a very good job, are they? Because it's being sold as propaganda. The gem of this book is in Chapter 7. The Pentagon, a consensus approach, is a very detailed analysis where Griffin shows the 9-11 truth movement has developed a complex, broad-based refutation of the official story of what happened at the Pentagon, uh, which was the claim was that the Pentagon was attacked by American Airlines at Flight 77 under the control of Al-Qaeda. He examines 14 facts which have been established by independent researchers on which there is universal agreement. And any, which, any one of which of these 14 facts is enough to demolish the official account. Griffin argues that the movement should concentrate on its Pentagon energies on further strengthening its advocacy of these points in agreement and avoid dissipating time, energy, and trust on a question which has taken up much of the resources in recent years, the question of what hit the Pentagon. He shows that this question is unanswerable with the evidence available. Only a genuine investigation of the 9-11 attacks will enable it to be answered. And you have the same case with these two buildings, that uh, two World Trade Center buildings that, that came down. They immediately removed all the rubble. So here you have uh, one of the largest uh, criminal events of, of recent history. Um, you know, it's only matched really by the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and 
perhaps some of the fire burning of, of Dresden in Germany. So it, it's, um, you c see, the evidence that's moved is related to a, a, a very high flammable uh, compound called thermite and is, is a basis of some of what they've discovered because the thermite was found in the clouds that were pushed out and away from the building sites. It, it still was there. So it shows it had a thermite base to it, which is why Building 7 can fall down in on itself without, without a, anything happening, having happened to it. So Chapter 8 illuminates the psychology of resistance to the truth about 9-11 events, which is so widespread, arguing that the real faith of the nominally Christian U.S. is a nationalist faith. The uh, critique of the official story laid out by the 9-11 truth movement is literally unthinkable for many, for even devout Christians whose religion calls upon them to avoid all kinds of idolatry, including nationalism. Uh, Griffin concludes that when Christian faith is subordinate to faith in American goodness, it becomes a blinding faith producing Christians uh, with eyes wide shut. So the subtitle of the book indicates that the 9-11 attacks, in being a false flag operation, carried out by elements in the U.S. government were a state crime against democracy. So with a primarily political purpose of imposing police policies or policies by force on the country and that the failure to carry out a genuine investigation, arrest the perpetrators, reverse the policies adopted by the government after 9-11 means that the operation has succeeded. But only to this point in time, a future is still open. Griffin provides a powerful conclusion in Chapter 9 and uh, suggests that how the 9-11 truth movement can continue with, uh, to press forward to the ne necessary investigation of the 9-11 crimes, reversal of the tragic course taken by the U.S. while under the control of criminals. So as, as a summary of this, uh, the superb book is written with, uh, unusual, or with usual clarity, logic, argumentative power readers have come to expect from David Ray Griffin. Uh, she is now employed in 10 books on the 9-11 attacks and this is sort of a, an updated culmination of all those uh, previous publications over 10 years of working on this by this individual. And uh, when state crimes against democracy see, succeed continues his advance at the cutting edge of, of the truth movement and uh, should be read by everyone who wants to take stock of what the movement has achieved and how to press on into a future in which illegal, immoral wars have been stopped and the uh, country's democratic ideals reaffirmed. So that's the end of the quote. And there's, there's a, a lot of stuff. Uh, we can take the, uh, you know, some of these other videos that I got previously to the Tabernacles again. Although we're going to have a bit of... Uh, a busy tabernacles talking about food and micro and macronutrients and, and what we can do about repairing our health, meaning meaning your um, your heart and other problems that we have for eating a processed foods and uh, meats with fats in them and that type of thing. Because I I, uh, I guess we all understand that you know we're under a, a society really. In, in all the West, and really, it's the, it's the law society basically that, that runs everything, uh, supposedly uh, in our interests, or, or sitting uh, set apart between the, the adversaries in a court. But uh, all these um, the courts and, and uh, appointed officials that claim claim guardianship. Now, you know, to to be a, all of you as parents hold a guardianship role of the trustees in your family, meaning your children. When they uh, move out of your house and get married and set up their own family, uh, they're re released from the parents' guardianship role of the trust. But they're all in, in the modern world are bonded. That's your birth certificate when it's posted uh, and um, based because your your parents informed on you by by making your your birth known with the in Canada it's the Registrar General that you're bonded you receive a bonding number and are in bond servitude now bond servitude has a scriptural